Hello friends, this is the Urdu Free Thinker. In this video, we will discuss one of the most iconic stories in the Bible and the Quran, the story of Moses. He's portrayed in the Quran and the Bible as a historical figure, a mighty leader who rescued his people, the Israelites, from Egyptian subjugation and led them through the deserts of Sinai to the land of Canaan, given to the Israelites by God. This story is set in ancient Egypt, and many biblical scholars set the date of these events from 12th century BC to 15th century BC, so after Joseph and before David and Solomon. Anyhow, let's dive into the story. According to the Bible and the Quran, the Israelites were subjugated by the Egyptians and their entire nation was forced into slavery. The Egyptians used the Israelites as a source of their massive construction projects and made them endure horrible abuse and suffering. The pharaoh of Egypt became fearful of the growing population of the Israelites, so he decided to kill all male infants of the Hebrews as a way to control their population. During this time, Moses was an infant, so his mother, fearful for his life, decided to put him in a basket and let him go on the river Nile in hope that he will find safety somewhere else. The basket made its way to the pharaoh's palace, and according to the Bible, the pharaoh's daughter, and according to the Quran, the pharaoh's wife, picked up the baby and decided to raise him. Moses grew up as a prince of Egypt and became an important member of the pharaoh's household, but he eventually heard rumors that he was in fact a Hebrew and was not an Egyptian by blood, which turned out to be true, and then he became more and more empathetic towards the slaves. One day, when he saw an Egyptian soldier beating a Hebrew slave, he intervened and ended up killing the Egyptian. This effectively made Moses a criminal. Moses was no longer trusted, and as a criminal he was forced to leave Egypt. He crossed the deserts of Sinai and found his way into the land of Midian, believed to be northwest Arabia. Here Moses married, had children, but one day, many years later, he saw a burning bush, and God spoke to him. God told Moses that he was chosen for the mission of saving God's favorite people, the Israelites, from slavery. Moses then went to Egypt and confronted the Pharaoh and commanded him to let his people go. But the Pharaoh refused to let his entire labor force just leave Egypt. This followed a lot of drama, and eventually God delivered ten plagues to Egypt, such as turning the river Nile into blood and having some series of disasters like overgrowth of amphibians, disease on livestock, hail and fire, locusts and other calamities which forced the Pharaoh to free the Israelites eventually. This resulted in the entire Hebrew nation, hundreds and thousands of people, departing Egypt all of a sudden. They went as far as the Red Sea to cross into the Sinai, but then Pharaoh changed his mind and met them with his chariots at the sea. Faced with certain death, God parted the sea for his nation so that they may cross into safety but the army of the Pharaoh drowned in their chase. After this miracle, this victory and deliverance, the Israelites wandered into the deserts of the Sinai Peninsula for 40 years until they finally received their promised land, Canaan, and settled there as a nation. This is hands down my favorite story from the Bible and the Quran. But is this a historical event, or is it just another myth and a legend? The first major problem with the story is the lack of evidence surrounding it. The events of the Exodus appear in many history books, but the only source of the story is the Old Testament of the Bible, or the Torah, which is later reiterated by the Quran. If this is indeed a historical event, based on the massive and epic scale of the revolt and the departure of slaves from Egypt, this event should have left numerous traces archaeologically and hence should have been quite easy to prove. For the past two centuries, numerous Western archaeologists have been digging up the entire Middle East, and many of them were biblical archaeologists like William F. Albright, who had the bias of trying to prove the Bible correct, but even they were unable to find evidence to prove that this actually happened. According to the Torah, in the Book of Numbers, there were over 600,000 Hebrew males that left Egypt, if we estimate the number of women and children, this number will rise to 2 to 3 million people in total that left Egypt with Moses. 
During the 13th century BC, the entire population of Egypt was around 7 million people. If 25-40% to 40 of the population of the Egyptian Empire, which according to the story were used as the primary labor force, decided to leave Egypt all of a sudden, the entire Egyptian Empire would have collapsed. But this never happened. Furthermore, based on the Bible and the Quran, there were many years of slavery in Egypt. The Quran doesn't give an exact number, but it is implied that the Hebrews were in Egypt for many generations as the pharaoh saw their population grow and wanted to exterminate the male infants to reduce their population. The Bible gives an exact number, however, 400 years of Hebrew presence in Egypt. There are many empires and kingdoms that didn't last this long, and fell or were completely destroyed by rival empires, and yet we still find evidence for their existence. The Akkadian Empire, the Hittite Empire, or even smaller kingdoms like the Kingdom of Mitanni, Yamhad, and so forth. But this story of slavery, where an entire race, an entire ethnicity, an entire nation is enslaved by another, has no evidence whatsoever. There are no mixed Hebrew-Egyptian inscriptions from the New Kingdom of Egypt. There is no evidence of purchase or selling of Hebrew slaves. There is no evidence of anyone listing the names of their Hebrew slaves on tombs and papyri. Also, there is no evidence of accounting for the Hebrew workforce living in Egypt. The Egyptians were so meticulous in their record keeping that even the United Kingdom's Office of National Statistics website has attested to this. On their website, it reads, From around 2500 BC, the Egyptians used censuses to work out the scale of the labor force. There is complete darkness if one tries to look for the Hebrews in Egypt, not just in the Egyptian records, but also there is a lack of archaeological evidence hinting of a suppressed culture. In the book, Exodus, written by Carl Myers, it states, The Hebrew Bible may look like a history book, and it is its appearance as history that has led to much investigation of the period about which it purports to tell us, but it is no longer useful to think of Exodus in such terms. And later he continues, for the era of the supposed departure from Egypt and the journey through the Sinai Peninsula, archaeology is of little value. After more than a century of research and massive efforts of generations of archaeologists and Egyptologists, nothing has been recovered that relates directly to the account and exodus of an Egyptian sojourn, an escape or of a large-scale migration through the Sinai. Some say that the Egyptians did not record embarrassing history like losses, but most of their 400 years of enslavement of the Hebrews provides enough material for them to boast about. But again, there's nothing in the Egyptian records. In fact, the Egyptians do record an era in their history of a Semitic people that invaded Egypt and ruled over them the other way around. These were the Hyksos who established the 15th dynasty of Egypt before they were defeated by the native Egyptians. Looking outside of Egypt, there is nothing to be found in the Sinai itself. According to both the Bible and the Quran, Moses and his people wanted the deserts of Sinai for 40 years. The Sinai Desert is very dry. According to this paper, the average rainfall all over the Sinai Peninsula is only 40 millimeters. Furthermore, according to the Encyclopedia of Global Archaeology, hot, dry, arid climates provide excellent conditions for preservation. We can even tell where Bedouins have camped thousands of years back. This paper by Hofmeier and colleagues published in the Austrian Academy of Science Press mentions discoveries of ancient reed huts occupied by early desert dwellers or Bedouins. And through radiocarbon dating it was found that they go back to the time of the Second Intermediate Period or New Kingdom of Egypt, around 16th century BC to 12th century BC. However, there is no archaeological evidence of a massive group of people, an entire nation, with biblical estimates being around 2 million people, ever traversing through the desert. No human bones, no animal bones, no dwellings, no kitchens, no pottery, no Bronze Age weapons, no tablets, no papyri, nothing. There is no trace of this. The city of Rome at its zenith had a population of approximately 450,000 to a million people. A group of people, an entire nation double or quadruple the size of Rome at its peak, 
traveling through the desert and leaving nothing is hard to believe. In the book, Biblical History and Israel's Past by Megan Bishop Moore and Brad E. Kell, they write, Most histories of ancient Israel no longer consider information about the Egyptian sojourn, the exodus, and the wilderness wanderings recoverable or even relevant to Israel's emergence. By normal critical historical means, these events cannot be placed in a specific time and correlated with other known history, or claim that the stories are believable historically on the basis of inference, potential connections, and general plausibility. Another problem facing the story of Exodus is the mounting evidence that contradicts the biblical and Quranic narrative. There is substantial evidence that there was a massive Egyptian presence in Canaan between the 2nd millennium BC to the 1st millennium BC. The Egyptian empire under Ramses II, for example, who's often portrayed as the pharaoh of Moses, extended all the way to modern-day Syria. According to this paper by M. Hai Mazar from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, the town at Bet Shean in Canaan, modern-day Israel, had a New Kingdom-era Egyptian garrison further providing evidence of Egyptian domination over these lands around that time. If the story of Moses is supposed to have occurred around this time, then the Israelites left one corner of the Egyptian empire, wandered through the deserts over many years, only to find themselves back in Egypt in another province of the Egyptian empire. This would be a very sad end to the story, unlike what is in the Bible and the Quran. Clearly, the authors of the story were unaware of the fact that Canaan was already under Egyptian occupation. Furthermore, there is a Merneptah stele, which is a wall where the pharaoh Merneptah has recorded his victory against various enemies. Most of the stele talks about him defeating the Libyans, and finally it also mentions his victory over the people living in Canaan, and it says, The Canaan has been plundered into every sort of woe. Ascalon has been overcome. Gezer has been captured. Yenoam is made non-existent, Yisriar, or Israel, is laid waste and his seed is not. And here there is a word Yisriar, which is often translated by many as Israel. Although there is disagreement regarding this, if this is true, it is the first time the word Israel is recorded in history. If the word Yisriar refers to Israel, then Israel were a foreign people that were defeated and subdued in Canaan by the Egyptians under the pharaoh Merneptah. Taking this in context of the wider archaeological evidence, such as presence of Egyptian garrisons in the area, it is clear that Canaan was part of the Egyptian empire. There is no evidence of Israelites developing into an independent nation-state in the Canaan around this time. Furthermore, the Torah is considered the word of God, given to or inspired to Moses by all Jews, Christians, and Muslims. However, the Torah is in Hebrew. The problem is that there is no evidence that Hebrew existed in 14th to 12th century BC. The first evidence of Hebrew, or Paleo-Hebrew, is around 10th century BC, found in pottery around the time of David and Solomon. But the characters used here are not Hebrew, but proto-Canaanite characters. Therefore, some Israeli archaeologists like Amhai Mazar say that calling these inscriptions Hebrew might be too far-fetched, as the differentiation of proto-Canaanite languages at that time seems unclear. You can choose to believe in Islam, Christianity, or Judaism. That is your choice, and I respect that. But know that one of the most famous prophets of your religions has no basis in written history nor archaeology. The Torah, which is the primary source of the story of Moses, was not written down in 14th century BC when Moses supposedly lived. It is likely a mythical tale made by Israelites living much later, a legend of the origin of their people. It is a national story of struggle to unite them while facing foreign enemies at the time. But this nationalistic story was later appropriated by Christians and Muslims for themselves. The history of Christians and Muslims, despite believing in the nationalistic myths of the Jews, is filled with anti-Semitism. This is the incredible irony of the Abrahamic faiths.